Hello folks and welcome back to our fourth and final installment in the cellular respiration series trying to answer the question where does all your energy come from when you want to make a protein or copy your DNA or divide a cell or make new immune system components to fight an infection or dance a dance or sing a song where does that energy come from? We've termed all of these things cellular activities, and we've decided that the energy for them is provided by ATP. We've located the source of that ATP is principally coming from the activities of ATP synthase proteins embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. We've identified the power source of this ATP synthase as a proton gradient, which is established by the action of proton pumps namely the electron transport chain, which are themselves powered by the oxidation of the electron carriers NADH and FADH2 in conjunction with the final electron acceptor, oxygen. We've furthermore uh, discovered the source of these electron donors, NADH and FADH2. We've tracked it to the mitochondrial matrix, where the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle or tricarboxylic acid cycle, whatever you'd like to call it, pumps them out at a kingly pace. And we've said the citric acid cycle itself has an input, and that input, although there are more than, there's more than one input, the primary input of interest here is a molecule called acetyl-CoA. And where we left it off last time was asking the question, where does the acetyl-CoA come from? So as uh, a way of jumping in, let's take a look at an animation of the Krebs cycle and see just where this acetyl-CoA molecule fits in. Let's take a look. So here we are. Here is a Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle animation. Uh, let me orient you to this before we start playing it. What we've got here are the reactions of the citric acid cycle in black are the different uh, key molecules. And then you can see NADH uh, and it being formed from NAD+. You can see the carbon dioxide coming off at various points here. You can see the FADH2 being formed. There's your GTP. Uh, and so forth. So this should look somewhat familiar to you at this point. Now up here is where our acetyl-CoA comes in. So here's the acetyl-CoA. Here's one of the components of the citric acid cycle. This molecule here, oxaloacetic acid, also known as oxaloacetate, is going to combine with acetyl-CoA. Uh, we're going to be moving along this cycle on the left side of the screen, and on the right side of the screen, we're going to be zooming in and actually looking at the reaction mechanism. So let's just take a tour around the citric acid cycle and, and see what we can pick up. So we'll let it play. So here comes acetyl-CoA. It's binding to oxaloacetate, forming citric acid, also known as citrate. We can see a little rearranging occurs. We now call this molecule isocitrate or isocitric acid. There's our first NADH from the citric acid cycle and uh, carbon dioxide as well. Here's our next NADH and our next carbon dioxide. Here's our GTP, which uh, immediately goes and uh, produces some ATP. Here's our FAD forming FADH2. And uh, this uh, combination of water with this molecule fumarate or fumaric acid forms malic acid, which then recharges one more molecule of NAD plus into NADH. There it goes. And there we have our oxaloacetic acid again. And we are about to start the cycle over at the beginning. So acetyl-CoA is, is the energy input into this system. Everything else that you saw is a process of harvesting energy from this original input. So the question then is, is where does that energy come from? And before we go further and, and get into the details, let me say that there's actually multiple sources of acetyl-CoA in the cells. Uh, we're going to be looking, focusing in on one pathway, uh, acetyl-CoA as produced from the breakdown of glucose. So one source of acetyl-CoA is glucose. Glucose may be uh, processed in various ways to produce acetyl-CoA. But that's not the only place that acetyl-CoA can come from. That's not the only way to feed the citric acid cycle and therefore produce NADH and FADH2 to power your electron transport chain and your ATP synthase, blah, 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 blah. Uh, you can also get acetyl-CoA from burning lipids, uh, fatty acids. You can also get acetyl-CoA from breaking down amino acids. Actually, there are a couple of different ways you can feed amino acids into this cycle to harness their energy and, and just use them for, for raw energy rather than building proteins out of them. Um, and this probably shouldn't be a surprise to you. If you look at a food label, it's not just sugar 
that gives you calories, it's also fats and proteins. And you can burn any of these by feeding them into the citric acid cycle. Now, that said, for the sake of simplicity, we're just going to focus on one of those pathways. But I thought I ought to tell you, there are multiple pathways. There are actually multiple ways to uh, feed into this system and derive ATP from uh, different sources of food that you have. Okay, so that said, let's focus on the glycolytic pathway, the pathway that has to do with glucose. So if I can direct your attention back up here to the top of this little animation, then you can see here's our acetyl-CoA, but the acetyl-CoA is being formed from uh, originally this molecule here, which is called pyruvic acid or pyruvate. Uh, so here's the molecule that we're interested in that's going to turn into acetyl-CoA. Well, where does pyruvic acid come from? In order to answer that question, we're going to have to leave the mitochondrion and go to the cytoplasm of the cell. Remember, the cytoplasm is the space that's inside the cell membrane, but outside the nucleus, outside any other cellular organelles. So time to go to the cytoplasm and take a look at a process called glycolysis. Let's take a look. Okay, so we've found ourselves in the cytoplasm of the cell. It's a crowded place. It's jam-packed with proteins doing all manner of different things. Cytoskeletal filaments are crisscrossing. Motor proteins are crawling around. But among all of the chaos, uh, organized chaos of the cytoplasm, we also have a set of enzymes whose job it is to break down glucose into pyruvic acid or pyruvate. And that process is called glycolysis. Glycolysis meaning the breaking of sugar. So we've got the whole process laid out here step by step as was the case before. You are not responsible for knowing the particulars of this process, just the the general process and the inputs and outputs. So let's take a look. On the left side, we're going to be moving through the overall diagram, and on the right side, we're going to be focusing on a single molecule of glucose. So I'd like you to attract your attention to the single molecule of glucose over here. I think it's the more interesting part. So here we go. Glycolysis, meaning sugar breaking. So glucose hits the first enzyme, and what actually happens first, you'll see there, we actually just lost a molecule of ATP to add a phosphate group to glucose. This is sometimes called the uh, energy investment stage, or this animation calls it the preparatory stage of glycolysis. So we've added one phosphate. Here's another phosphate. We've just used up two ATP. So, so far we've lost energy. The uh, glucose with the two phosphates then splits in half. We then rearrange one of those halves to look like the other, and we're left with two molecules like this. There is a familiar molecule. This is a molecule of NADH. So I mentioned way back when that NADH didn't only come from the citric acid cycle. It actually is also produced by glycolysis. Not very much, but, uh, but a little bit. So there's some NADH that comes from the uh, intermediate stage of glycolysis. Now we're harvesting some energy. We've gotten some ATP here. We're doing a little bit more rearranging. There's a bit more ATP, and we're left with this molecule right here, pyruvic acid, also known as pyruvate. Remember, this is the very same pyruvic acid that shows up in the citric acid cycle. This is going to be converted into acetyl-CoA, Acetyl-CoA is then going to feed into the citric acid cycle to produce a whole lot more NADH and FADH2 in order to power the electron transport chain's proton pumps to build up that concentration difference of protons across the inner mitochondrial membrane. Those protons are going to flow across the membrane through ATP synthase, powering at its activity and allowing it to recharge ATP from ADP and phosphate. So what we've just seen here what we've just seen here is the breakdown of glucose into pyruvate. Along the way, we've picked up some ATP. We've also picked up some NADH, which will also migrate into the mitochondria and uh, provide for additional power to the electron transport chain. So in fact, NADH comes not only from the citric acid cycle, but also from glycolysis. Let's take a look at the summary of the process. So here we were. We worked our way back from cellular activities through the synthesis of ATP in the inner mitochondrial membrane, the electron transport chain, the oxidation of the electron donors, back through the citric acid cycle here to acetyl-CoA. Now we can identify one pathway for producing acetyl-CoA, which is via pyruvate and pyruvate via glucose. 
Uh, along the way, as glucose is transformed into pyruvate, we get some products. Those products are some ATP and some NADH. And, uh, and, and there you have it. If all is well, your cells are well supplied with everything they need. You go from glucose to pyruvate to acetyl-CoA through the citric acid cycle. You get your NADH, your FADH2. You combine those with oxygen. You power the electron transport chain. Your protons flow through ATP synthase. You recharge your ATP. And now you've got plenty of this energetic molecule to build your proteins, copy your DNA, divide your cells, dream your dreams, whatever your heart tells you. Fabulous. But what if things aren't quite so wonderful? What if you're missing one of these components? Namely, what if you're missing oxygen? You've fallen off of the boat, you've gotten your legs tangled up in some concrete blocks with chains on them, you've, you've sunk to the bottom of the sea, you've got no oxygen, the mermaids are coming to save you, but they're not there yet. How will you survive with no oxygen? Well, it poses quite a problem because remember, in order to power the electron transport chain, you need oxygen. With no oxygen, there's no proton gradient, there's no ATP synthase, there's very little ATP being produced. Is there none? No, there is a little bit, a little bit of ATP still being produced way back here. Remember, glycolysis itself produces two ATP per molecule of glucose. Now that's nothing compared to what you can get from the electron transport chain and ATP synthase. If you can do the whole process, we're actually looking at about 36 molecules of ATP per molecule of glucose. That's pretty darn good. That's 16 times what you would get from glycolysis alone. So we're talking about a big difference here, but you can still make ATP just by breaking the sugar apart into pyruvate. However, there's a problem here. Remember, for any chemical reaction to occur, we need to provide the appropriate reactants. In the case of glycolysis, the reactants are glucose, ADP, phosphate, and NAD+. We need all of these molecules in order to perform glycolysis. Now, the ADP is going to be no problem. You're going to use up the ATP that's left in your cells pretty quickly, and that'll provide the ADP and the phosphate. The glucose will presume you're well fed and there's plenty of glucose around. But here's the problem. The problem is the NAD. As you perform glycolysis, all of your NAD plus gets converted to NADH. If you run out of NAD plus, you can't do glycolysis anymore. If you don't have oxygen, you can't regenerate this NAD plus in the electron transport chain. Normally, this is where the NAD plus is regenerated. It can then go back all the way to glycolysis and allow glycolysis to continue. Uh, but in the absence of oxygen, you can't do this step. You quickly run out of NAD+, and now even glycolysis will fail you. Is there a way out? Is there a way to survive? There is, but you're not going to like it. An alternate pathway for pyruvate, instead of moving through the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain to yield an additional 34 ATP, it's basically just to throw it away in order to regenerate your NAD+. So this is an alternate reaction pathway that pyruvate can take. The result is that your NADH gets converted back to NAD+. You can then continue glycolysis. You don't get any additional energy from the breakdown of pyruvate. Remember, you could have gotten 34 ATP from these pyruvate molecules, but instead you get nothing just so you can keep doing glycolysis for two ATP per molecule. It's, 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 a, it's a pretty pathetic yield, but if it's all you've got, then you have to deal with it. Uh, now there are byproducts of this process as well. If you are a human, which if you're watching this, I presume you are, then you produce a molecule called lactic acid. You might be familiar with this. Lactic acid is the molecule you produce in your muscles when you're working them really hard and you start to feel the burn. Um, this is because your muscles are consuming oxygen faster than your bloodstream can bring it in, and so your, your muscle cells are actually having to resort to this alternate pathway in order to continue producing ATP. If you're a yeast, 
I presume you're not because you're watching this video, but if you are some sort of hyper-intelligent yeast, then you do not produce lactic acid. You produce ethanol and carbon dioxide, and uh, this process is the basis of all of the human brewing activity to produce beer and wine and, and things like that. This process, whether it's done by humans or by yeasts, whether it produces lactic acid or ethanol and carbon dioxide, has the same name. We call it fermentation. So glycolysis in the presence of oxygen will lead to the citric acid cycle, the electron transport chain, gobs and gobs of ATP. In the absence of oxygen, if you don't have enough, if you're suffocating, if there's some other problem, you'll have to make use of fermentation instead. You'll produce lactic acid as a byproduct, but critically, you'll regenerate that NAD plus that you need to make ATP. Now, this won't keep you alive forever, because again, you're producing two ATP per glucose instead of 36 ATP per glucose, but it's enough to keep you going for a little while. So, we've reached the end of the cellular respiration story. In the presence of oxygen, glucose is broken down into pyruvate with a yield of a couple of ATP. The pyruvate is further modified into acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA feeds into the citric acid cycle, which re results in the production of NADH and FADH2, which are oxidized by oxygen, via the electron transport chain producing a proton gradient which powers ATP synthase which spins around to make ATP which powers your cellular activities. In the absence of oxygen we take the fermentation route down to lactic acid and we can then continue glycolysis to produce a small amount of ATP. So we've answered the question, where does the energy for your cellular activities ultimately come from? And we have mostly explored this route what we call the glycolytic route, the route of burning glucose for energy, because a heck of a lot of the energy you use does indeed come from glucose. Not all of it. Some comes from amino acids, which come from proteins. Some would come from fatty acids, which come from lipids and your fat stores on your body. Uh, but much of it does come from glucose. So we've answered the question. The energy comes from glucose, lipids, proteins that you break down to feed your cellular furnaces. Feels good. I think it, we finally, we finally come to some resolution. We now know, we now know where, where all the energy comes from. That's good. But oh no. Where does the glucose get its energy from? Where do the lipids get their energy from? The, the proteins. Why is food food? Where does all that energy come from? Next time on Cellular Energetics, how does your food get its energy? We'll see you then. Bye for now.